Hi, I'm Daniel Tumpkin. I'm an artist and programmer, perhaps best known for my blog, Esoteric Codes, about SLANGs and code art. But today I'm going to talk about another passion of mine, which is dithering. Back in the 1970s, they wanted to work out how to represent an image that has many colors using a small palette, such as black and white, for the pixels available on monitors of that era. Now, one approach would be simply to round each pixel to the nearest in palette color. Um, so the darker pixels would round to black in this example, and the brighter ones would, would round to white. But you can see how we lose a lot of detail that way. Dithering was developed to help you regain some of that detail. The flavor of dithering I'm going to talk about today is error diffusion dithering. For the first pixel, it works exactly the same way. You round towards black or white. But the amount that you round, like let's say we start with a pixel that's 60% black. If we round it the rest of the way to be a fully black uh, pixel, then we've introduced uh, an error of 40%. We take that 40% and we divide it among the pixels neighboring that one um, and round them a little bit in the other direction. Then we evaluate the next pixel and that one has already been shifted a little bit and now its error gets distributed to the pixels around it. And that way the error gets distributed all around the image. Now dithering doesn't have to be just to black and white. It can be to 16 colors or 256 colors or actually to any arbitrary palette. And it's still widely used. It's just not as obvious with monitors that have tiny pixels and huge palettes of color. Now there are many different uh, dithering kernels that we can use. The kernels are the coefficient sets for that error distribution. The most commonly used one is called Floyd Steinberg, and that's the one that Photoshop uses, although they have their own proprietary version of it. There's another one called Atkinson, which was invented by Bill Atkinson of uh, HyperCard fame. And Atkinson is very good for keeping contrast in the midtones, but loses some detail in the darkest and lightest areas because not all of the error is carried over. These kernels have not changed in decades. So I recently spent a week at the Recurse Center, virtually, and wrote a scoring algorithm to see which of the dithering patterns match best with the original image. And I do this by blurring both the dithered and undithered image and then compare them using structural similarity index measure. To make sure I'm not introducing bias, I used one of the freely available data sets of faces from Creative Commons Flickr images, which I actually pared down myself with an emphasis on diversity. I also included some line art, which is difficult to dither well and trips up some of these dither kernels. I used a simple machine learning process, simulated annealing, to generate new dithering kernels to test. And I used both large and small versions of the images, starting with all the small ones to quickly weed out the ones that aren't going to, to work very well. It turns out out of the random generated ones that, that I created, um, the most interesting were not the ones that were high testing because they end up being very similar to what we already have, but are usually just more complicated. Actually, it was the medium to low testing ones where the pattern of the dither interferes with the content of the image where things got more interesting. And here I have a series of images of the David, um, which I picked because it's so recognizable. And you can see in these examples, the noise and signal begin to merge, the dither encroaching into the subject matter. In addition to that, there are certain types of visual artifacts that are particularly distracting, such as vertical stripes. Here is an extreme case of this, where we have a kernel that has only one row. So no error is carried from one row to the next. In each one, it's as if it begins at the beginning again, which almost always causes these vertical stripe artifacts. But even without the artifacts, you can just have noise. Um, I have a whole collection here of Snowy David pictures. Dithers that drop some of that error, where not all of it is, is carried over to surrounding pixels, those lead to the high contrast images, like my collection here of goth Davids. So now that I had a test that, that um, scored kernels, I decided to bring it in a different direction. And I considered alternate computer histories. What if our screens had not been rectangular and, and did not have square configurations of pixels? What if we had triangular or hexagonal pixel configurations or, or, or other patterns? And I decided to focus on the equilateral triangle and to fake this out by creating triangular pixels that are 10 square pixels high. Then for each of those pixels, I get the average color. 
And from that, I dither it the same way I dithered the original square images and do the same comparison. So equilateral triangles are similar to squares in that each pixel has a neighbor in each of the cardinal directions. They have an up neighbor, down, right, and left. So we'd expect that the same kernels would test well. And it turns out that they do. Uh, here's an image from the Flickr data set and its triangular pixel version. And here is an image of me sanding that I used um, also for some of my tests. Pixelated, it looks like this. Here's a smaller pixelated version. And um, it turns out that the originals, like Floyd Steinberg, do pretty well. But they have some problems because the checkerboard pattern, which is very, very common uh, in the original dither patterns when you hit the 50% mark. Th this was actually something that Floyd and Steinberg and the other developers of these dither kernels wanted, that at 50% you would have uh, a perfect checkerboard. The variation is Atkinson, where we also have a checkerboard, but it's, it's larger. It's uh, two by two pixels for each one. Um, this works pretty well with square pixels, but with triangles, it creates sort of a flat looking area, which is kind of distracting the same way that the, the vertical stripes were distracting in, in the square pixels. So it turns out that my test um, actually uh, picked up on this and some of my randomly generated kernels actually tested better than, than Floyd Steinberg did um, in the triangular space. So I am actually still testing triangles, but I'm also underway creating the next shape, hexagons. But it turns out for hexagons, there actually is a place that we're already doing hexagonal dithering, and that's in the printer, um, because the printer layout of, of, um, of printer dots is actually a, a hexagonal pattern, and there actually are dithering kernels for that as well. So I'm doing this as part of a 10-year project called Dither Studies where I dither not photographic images, but solid colors. And I dither them to palettes of complementary colors, opposite colors, to make the dithering artifacts as obvious as possible, as visible as possible. And this is something I've done through, uh, I have a web app, um, I have videos and uh, room size installations of those videos. Um, and more recently, over the last few years, I've created this series of paintings. But before I start actually painting triangular dithers, I want to find the, the triangular dither algorithms that actually work. So why study dithers? What, what's so fascinating about, about dithering? For me, the error diffusion dithering, it, it's a very simple algorithm. It uses nothing more than grade school math, and yet the patterns, when applied to solid colors, feel very irrational. Um, to me, it's reminiscent of early computer art, art by people like Vera Molnar and Hiroshi Kuwano, um, but really illustrate how little complexity it takes before logic feels irrational to us. It's a great illustration of that gulf between human intent and logic that occurs every time that we sit to write code. Thank you very much.